Yeah, I want to talk about some things. Okay. Um, I remember what I forgot last week. Okay. And I was I was talking about something, and I forgot what I I lost like track of what I was trying to say. But what I was saying was like uh, I was gonna say a Ponzi scheme, and like that's kind of how I look at this situation, and just how our government operate in general from their propaganda standpoint on things and just how the news we receive is it's kind of like a Ponzi scheme and it's like and like I was looking at what was the movie Fahrenheit 9-11 like probably six to eight months ago okay. and I don't agree with everything on there but you know some of the stuff you know like when they show coverage you know of news outlets talking about it uh, invading Iraq and when it, everything first happened everybody was like yes we need to invade Iraq they got weapons of mass destruction like it was a push and not only push it was propaganda to invade Iraq and you know and then it's people like Joseph Wilson who was a diplomat over there in Iraq they never covered his story and his wife's story you know so it was kind of like huge propaganda and, you know, once they invaded, it, it continued, you know, blaming Saddam for this, blaming him for that. Now, I'm not saying he's a good person, but you just can't invade people's countries and leave them war-torn because they're a dictator. If that, if that was the case, we would have did that to North Korea, we would have did that to Russia, we would have did that, you know, to places like Cuba. You know, we wanted to go to war with Cuba, but, you know, that was a long time ago. But you just can't do that, you know, because everything America do is not technically legal itself, legal either, because, but the difference with a dictator in a democracy, you got so many people you can blame before it actually get to a point where you can invade a democracy because... It's so many people that in the democracy or agencies, you can say, well, such and such was in charge of this. I got plausible deniability. I didn't know anything about it. You know, so you can't say, okay, that's an excuse to invade America. Well, with a dictatorship, you can, you know, but that don't mean you should, or it's ethical knowing that you're going to affect people who ha haven't done anything. But yeah, like, you know, it's, it's kind of like a Ponzi scheme because if you see media talk about, you know, the wars in the Middle East now, they, I saw a story they had probably a little over a year ago where they talk about the people, the, you know, the, our government and leaders, they had no clear directive of what they was trying to accomplish when they invaded Iraq. It was just like, you know, they went there, they didn't achieve nothing, they didn't accomplish nothing. And that's why I say it's a Ponzi scheme, because we see the effects of what happened throughout that war and how we haven't achieved nothing on the surface, but we went over there for that reason. You know, so of course they can say we went over there we took for their oil. They're not going to say we went over there and took their oil. So, now that there's nothing to show for the war besides the, their oil, it's like, well, what did we achieve? Did we free the Iraqi people? Look at all the wars that came after we were starting to ship soldiers back to America. So they achieved what they wanted. They just can't talk about what their um, wants were and needs and what they felt their needs were, you know. And I consider that like a Ponzi scheme because so when our American citizens and the American people start to lose doubt in our government and the media, they slowly admit to what they was doing and how dumb it was and pointless it was or the mistakes they made only so they can send you down another rabbit hole. So it's kind of like a Ponzi scheme to where, okay, we know why we're doing this. Like a Ponzi scheme, we, we trying to steal the money. Like they do these things, the media and the government do these things to um, get you to reinvest 
get you to recommit to their agendas unknowingly because they're never telling you the truth about why they're doing what they're doing to begin with. You know, and I see that with my situation. You know, like, like when I was looking at Michael Moore movie, it was showing how everybody who was on TV talked about we need to invade Iraq, Saddam this, Saddam that. And I see that with me. You know, it's parallels with my situation. If I look at TV, I see how everybody, you know, say, oh, this is just the beginning, you know. And it don't matter if you're right wing or left wing, you know. They say things like, just the beginning. Oh, you're a criminal. Oh, you're this. Oh, you're that. You know, and you don't see people get on TV and say, well, the reality is, this is a violation of his human rights. You know, just like Joseph Wilson, when he said Saddam didn't have weapons, people wouldn't cover that story. If they would cover that story, they probably would have lost their job or even something much worse would have happened to them. And same thing here. You know, people are not going on TV saying, oh, Terrell's innocent, which is true. Or, you know, this has been playing ever since he was 18, year old, 18 years old. But they talk about the STD scare. They talk about a bunch of things like that on TV. And the reality is, when they originally planned to do this to me, um, none of those things existed, you know, to the point. You know, like when I was, I would say 18 and 19, I went to the doctor because, you know, I, I always sweat a lot in the private area. And I went to the doctor, the same office that actually the doctor that gave me this mind reading medicine, but he wasn't in that day. And I was like 18 and 19, I went to his office. My mother dropped me off there and my aunt was coming that way and she picked me up. And the doctor said it was jacket. She gave me jacket to clean my knees and it worked. You know, and ever since then, when you know, I would have, you know, like, what's the, what's the good word for it? Have, like, because I got real sensitive skin. Like, mm -hmm. so anytime I would have, like, a breakout, you mm -hmm. know, I would go get jockage cream. And this throughout from the time I was 18, 19, all the way up until I was 21, months before they put me on this medicine. And I couldn't get control of the jockage. And... That's why, it, you know, in a lot of ways, it was like an STD scare. I was like, and I, it, but I've already was tested. So, you know, it was some paranoia. And then, you know, so, but like, that's besides the point. You can't, because like how I look at TV, like when I look at. See, do, you, do you watch much TV now? I ain't got nothing else to do. You know, um, the, the, rea the reality is I don't talk to nobody. You know, um, you know, so in a lot of ways, I'm in a situation where it's kind of like Stockholm 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 syndrome, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, these people, it's like I need these people because they done ruined, ruined all my relationships and made it to the point where people don't like me, people don't want to be around me, it's too uncomfortable to be around me, so... I find myself running to them, you know, looking at TV. And prior to medicine, I didn't look at a lot of TV. You know, I was a workaholic. Um, I would hang out with friends. I would, you know, um, sometimes I would go to like the gym and stuff like that. But now I don't have nothing else to do. And then I don't have no money to really go out in the community because I get a disability check, but that's I live in I'm a, sure that barely covers. Barely, it doesn't. It doesn't cover. You know, like I live in, I like I got government assisted housing, food stamps. I'm in Williamsburg, which is an expensive place to live, and I get a third of minimum wage, and that's including my food stamps. Like mm -hmm. my, I think it's like five dollars and eighty seven cent at forty hours a week. You know, that's if you was to do like working hours, like mm -hmm. forty hours mm -hmm. a week. My my disability will average out to five dollars an hour, like five eighty seven, you know, and that's including the food stamps I get, you know, and minimum wage is what eleven dollars now, and yeah, even I that, lost track, and even that's yeah. not enough to get by. Right, 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 right. That doesn't support people, you know. So, and it doesn't help when people get upset with me. That that's the first thing they go after, and what I mean by that is they're overcharging me for rent. 
you know, they won't give me this, the government assistance I qualify for. Anytime they feel I disobey or I'm not doing what they want or I got a behavior problem, the first thing we go after is my finances. You know, and, and it's, not, it's actually illegal, but they get away with it. Like, but yeah, like, um, I can't wait to the next point, but you know, like, I look at this situation, I'm like, yo, this is, this has gone on for too long, and it needs to stop, and, um, it's 16 years now, like, this month marks 16 years that I've been going through this, and, you know, so, it's like, what are my rights, like, when I look at this situation, what are my rights, really, you know, because, um, and this is stuff I wrote down. Like, who's presenting evidence that there was a crime or a reason for them to give me this medicine to begin with? Because I would like to see it. You know, because there is no evidence I committed a crime and that's why they gave me this medicine. You know, and, not, and on top of that, you know, it's proven fact that this has been premeditated on their end for three years prior to the incident that led up to me being on this medicine. And like that incident, I won't go into detail without a lawyer, but I will say this. You know, um, it was an incident where I was in a vehicle and I was in Newport News and I didn't know what was going on. Basically, what happened that led to me being in Newport News in Norfolk, I was I was stressed out from triple E utility, from what they was having my family and friends and ex-girlfriends say and do to me. And I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping. I, I think I told you about that. And I went to sleep in the middle of the day, woke up at about 12 or 1 o'clock, went to look at TV. Next thing I know, they kept showing the commercials over and over and over. It was a Girls Going Wild commercial, which was on Spike TV, which is a Viacom affiliate. It was owned by um, Viacom. And then on BT, um, they were showing the Wayne's Brothers um, episode, and they would show the Jamie Foxx episode. Well, the Jamie Foxx episode played off of Cameron, and it talks about Ferraris, where Cameron said all my N-words come from minimum wages, and so on, so on. And he said something about half Ferraris and flavors, meaning half Ferraris in different colors. And I looked at a Jamie Foxx episode, which actually was a real episode, and they kind of molded, I think Cameron, I think there was a strategy, and Cameron actually was told to rap about the Ferraris because they was planning on using that episode. You know, it was like, it was mosaic in a sense, how it was something they put together to mean something. And it was an episode about Ferraris and um, it just, at the time, and I'm like, you know, something, this is weird. And then they kept showing Girls Going Wild's commercials over and over. And then on the uh, Wayne's Brothers um, episode I saw that night, I think I was telling you about this too a couple weeks ago, about how my phone was completely, my work phone for Triple E, the battery was completely dead and it started beeping. And this was an episode that really had nothing to do with me, but they made it, but they put it together to make it mean something. And the same thing with the Wayne's Brothers. It was an episode where they talk about a phone doing weird things. And all this happened that night or early morning, like 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. And they kept showing girls going wild commercials. And I'm like, this is weird. I think the TV is kind of talking to me. That was my suspicion. Okay. So what happened after that? Was that the first time you thought that the TV was talking to you? Yes. Yes. It's the first and, time you can remember. And, and no, it, it was the first that, time. It, it okay. Was, it was the first time. 
And, you know, and my thing is, I'm like, um, looking at it now, I question that Triple E somehow put me on this medicine so they was able to do what they did as far as communication with me. But I can't prove that. So I just got to go with the fact that or go with a fact or a possible fact that my childhood doctor put me on it. The, 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 the suspicion, yeah. you know. That but you're, I'm you're very thought. suspicious of even things that happened that morning uh, when I got, took the vehicle and the, and what happened with the TV and made me wonder how they was able to do all those things. But, um, yeah, so back to the TV, like, they kept show, showing girls going wild commercials. I'm like, is the TV talking to me? And then I've never seen this before. They showed, uh, it was like, that's when the ringtones, I first, that was the first time I ever saw the ringtone thing where they tell you text such and such number and you can get this ringtone, which was no. music stuff. And that okay. was real big and early. Once, once this situation started, ringtone music became a real big thing. Like where you could get your favorite artist ringtone in when someone called you, it rings. Right, music. right, right. So, so you can have a different ringtone for your mom and yeah, a different ringtone for your best friend. Yeah. yeah. So that's that was my introduction into the ringtone. And I just never seen ringtones before as like my introduction. And maybe that was the first time it was ever used. And then they just carried on and made something out of it to where they incorporated it into everyday life. But the ringtone kept showing on TV and then Girls Gone Wild's commercials kept showing on TV. And I'm like, I think the TV talking to me. And so I text the ringtone number and this was 2006 where you had flip phones. It wasn't the era of these type of phones, smartphones. I text the ringtone number and within minutes, on the front screen of the flip phone that only usually show the battery life, the, the, the time, and the date, I got a text message telling me, and I've never seen this before either, telling me to be at such and such place at such and such time. And then it said, or else. And it scared me. I actually freaked out. And I, I actually cried and everything, you know, because... All the stuff that was going on before that day, you know, it kind of triggered me to feel frightened. You know, my, sure. my mother sure. had came to me and she had hugged me and she was crying and everything. And she wouldn't tell me anything about why she was crying. You know, all the stuff that was going on at work. I'm asking people, you know, what it, what is going on from exes to friends, you know, to family. And wouldn't nobody tell me anything. Well, anyway, after that incident with the TV and them telling me to be at such and such place, time, or else, that's what caused me to take a vehicle. Well, I took a vehicle. I really didn't know what they wanted. I had no weapon, no gun, no knife, no nothing. And I really had no clue of what I was supposed to do. And, you know, I, I had my imagination ran wild. But it wasn't a premeditated thing to where, you know, it was something that I ever thought of before. Right, and right. In that moment. In that moment. Like, and, you know, and looking back, I'm like, well, you know, it wasn't something you would go to the police with. Because actually, people was lying on me saying I was stealing gas. They was going to call the police on me. Then local and state police was harassing me. And it just wasn't one of those things where... You go to police, you know, because they could be anyone, you know, like you've seen the movies, you know, but that's what it was like being in the movie because the things I saw, you would only see in movies, you know, and <clears throat> for a prime example, when I was in Newport News, there was, I didn't know what I was doing. I got out of the car in Newport News on the interstate and I'm like... Am I supposed to get in another car? I saw a car park. So this is there. when you took the car. This, you're still talking car. this. The same I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know what to do. When I was in Newport News, I was like, "There's a car outside the road. And I'm, am I supposed to get in that car? And they're gonna tell me what I'm supposed to do?" You know. And 
I got out the vehicle on side of the interstate, went over and looked at another car that was, I guess, broke down, but I didn't know that. And when I got out the car, I dropped my phone, my watch. Well, I dropped a phone, a watch, and a pack of cigarettes. And this was in Newport News. And I didn't realize I had dropped it when I got out the car. It was sitting on my lap. When I got out the car and it fell and I didn't even notice it because I was, I was so scared and, right. moving, and moving at a fast pace. Well, when I get to Norfolk, I realized I ain't got... So you got back in your car and left drove to War Norfolk. This stuff was left on the side of the road. In it... Newport News on Interstate 64. Well, when I get to Norfolk, I go over to a, I go to a um, convenience store. And when I walk in the convenience store, I see, which was obvious, government agents. They was over there looking at magazines. They was watching me, watching everything I was doing. And... When I so I left out the store, I didn't buy anything. I left out the store. I don't even remember why I went to the store, but anyway, I went to the store and I left out the store and went to get back in the car, opened the door, and my cell phone, cigarettes, and watch was sitting on the seat. And I'm not making this up. So, so, so how do you know that they were on the side of the road if they were because I looked for them? Because Norfolk to I mean, Newport News to Norfolk is what maybe a 25 30 minute drive mm. i look for those things you know and they were sitting on the seat i know for sure i dropped them and they was actually sitting on the seat and and you know they, they real smart like the government's real smart because you know i was also being followed by it was a lot of them you know people in black suvs with shades on it was a lot of them. I mean, coming from every angle, they was following me. And so what I did was I broke the phone and threw it out the window because I didn't know why people was following me because I hadn't done anything. I broke the phone and threw it out the window. And then it was like they stopped following me. But, you know, and I thought, you know, that, that they lost because they was, I thought, you know, they was, following me through GPS. Mm -hmm. So I thought that I really, that they really lost me during the, through, due to me throwing the phone out the window. But as I got older, I thought about that. I was like, that was just a trick because if that was the case, they would have lost me when I dropped the phone in Newport News. They let me think that they was, that I, that they had lost me, that I had lost them. Mm -hmm. They let me think mm -hmm. that, you know, and it goes to show you how good they are at their job. Like, you know, I'm just, at the time, I'm a 21-year-old kid. And, you know, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a spy. You know, they deal with real spies on every single day from countries of people that educate them, educate spies, train spies, teach them couple of different languages, got good educations. I'm none of those things. So for me to think that, and it wasn't even a thing where I thought I outsmarted the government. I thought that, you know, it, that I, I lost them. And it wasn't like, oh, I'm outsmart the government. Let me throw my phone. It was just something, it was more of a reaction because people was following me. And I didn't know what was going on. And on the way home, they intercepted the radio of the vehicle. And it was like, it was a good thing you turned around and went home. Because if not, we was going to kill you. You know, that's what, that was said on the radio. You know, but I, I know for sure I dropped that phone in. Cigarettes and the watch. Because I looked for it. And if I was sitting on it, I would have felt that I was sitting on it. And not just that, my cigarette packs would have been, would have been my cigarette pack would have been crushed, you know. So I know for sure that I left it inside the interstate in Newport News, you know. And you know, but that's the, the incident that happened. And that's, you know, I'm not gonna say speculate to why I think all that happened, or why or what I thought they wanted me to do. I'm not gonna speculate what I think the reason, you know, 
I talk about it more with a lawyer, but none of those things is what they wanted. I will say that. I think, you know, it was just something they did to give me this medicine in which that was the plan all along because I went home. <laughs> and allergies. I went home. You know, if you need a tissue. You yeah, went, yeah. Allergies are big yeah. right now. I, I went home, didn't tell anybody about what I saw, seen, or what happened. I didn't tell anybody, not my mother, not my stepfather, not my family, not, not my cousin's brother, no one. And a week later, they waited a whole week before they gave me this medicine. A week later, they called the house, and I overheard the doctor that gave me this medicine tell say that I saw too much and to bring me into his office. And I went to his office and this is what he said to me. He was like, you know, you lost your job in Richmond, triple E. You and your ex-girlfriend broke up in the past, about a little over a year or almost a year. Um, you wrecked your car coming home from work. I got some symbolic to which is depression medicine. Why don't you try this medicine for depression? And me not really knowing much about mental health and depression and all that, you know, I took the medicine and after like two or three days, I took a pill of it. And here we are today. I've been stuck with the medicine ever since. Now, this is how I like to look at that. You know, they can say, well, the government can say, well, they didn't do anything illegal because I chose to take the medicine, which would probably be what they would do. Oh, you chose to take it. I didn't choose to take it in that sense. I chose to take depression medicine. So look at it like this. If if to, if, a, if a lady go to a bar and a gentleman walk up to her and say, can I buy you a drink? And she say yes. And then he roofie her and put something in her drink. Would that be illegal? You know, I'm asking sure, her. Sure, sure. So that would be illegal. So that's kind of what they did to me. You know, so this is not an admission of guilt of anything because they will say that too. That's not why I took the medicine. I don't even know why I took the medicine. You know, because I didn't have a strong... I was educated on depression. And at the time, I, I was severely depressed because like I was saying, you know, I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping. And I thought he gave me depression medicine, but he gave me mind reading medicine. And I've been stuck on it ever since. But just like, you know, the what I was saying with the girl at the bar, because she chose to take a drink from a, a stranger they don't give that stranger a get out of jail free call for Rufy and him. Just like Rufy and her. You know, just like I chose to take a depression medicine from a doctor and he spiked it with something else or gave me spike medicine, which is actually the reality. That doesn't make it legal that they can violate my human rights. Because, you know, I, I live in Williamsburg. So, at any time, what's the population of Williamsburg? I could look it up. But it's, I don't it's, know. it's over at least, what, 15,000, maybe? I would think. Yeah, you know, so you look at Williamsburg, James City County. I don't know how the air pieces work. I don't know if there's an age limit. Do you have to be 18 to get an air piece? I don't know if it's 10 year olds or 8 year olds walking around with air pieces. I have no clue to how any of that work. So, but anywhere, I'm sure there's enough people over 18 who has an earpiece. And they could start it at a young age, like 16. But anyway, there could be over 10,000 people. I know it's at least 10,000 or more in Williamsburg population in Jane City combined. There's at least 10,000 people at any given time walking around with an earpiece. I, and this is what I assume. Listening to my thoughts. And I didn't approve that. I gave nobody the okay that they could do that to me. You know, and 
it's a major human right violation. And the and what makes me mad about it, that's when the celebrities come in. You know, and not just that, you know, and this is I'm gonna read what I wrote. And then they read my mind, use my imagination with things that didn't happen, things that are untrue to persecute to persecute me in the court of public opinion to distract from a human's human rights violation. That's what they do to me every single day. They want to show people that Terrell is the bad guy. They you know, just like the propaganda they did with Bill Wright. And they don't tell everything. They want to but like the stuff I'm telling you, they're not talking about that. You know, and you know, and the thing about it is that's where the celebrities come in because you know they using celebrity influence. I guess because I'm on this medicine and celebrities are making songs about me and I'm mingling, you know, not necessarily mingling with, but we are in communication. They respond to some of my thoughts, whether on Instagram, on TV, or whatever, or movies, and it's like I'm mingling with celebrities, and they are talking about me, making movies about me, that. I'm supposed to be okay with the humans, the human right violation, because I'm not, you know, and I was just thinking about that this morning, you know, I look at how some celebrities, you look at like Beyonce and Jay-Z when they had their children, they, it, you know, they hide their children from the public, you know, they don't show photos of their children, and then after like six months when they do show a photo of their child, they get paid millions of dollars to do it. You know, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a fairly cool individual. I'm not about getting people in trouble and getting people arrested. So if somebody do something to me, like, if somebody was to steal something from me and I was to catch them, I would just make them give me my item back and let them go about their business. I'm not going to make them give me my item back, then call the police, get them arrested, and then they go to jail for six months to a year. I'm not that type of person. You know, so I'm naturally a cool individual. Like, I, I'm understanding I'm cool. But my personality shouldn't give them the right to violate my human rights. You know, and that's how I look at this situation. I, you know, that, you know and that's why I haven't thought of it, thought of think. That's why I haven't thought of this sooner, like, you know, and made it a focal point of, like, discussions and conversations we have that they violate my human rights. I've always thought about it from time to time, but it's never been something where I doubled down and said, enough is enough, stop violating my human rights. For one, it ain't going to do nothing but land me in the hospital. And two, just like people in the community. Every single person with an earpiece is partaking and violating my human right. But have, do I confront people? Do I try to pull earpieces out people's ears? No, I don't. And I'm not going to do that. You know, and not everybody is like that. You know, you know, I know people, I'm sure you do too. Everybody know that one person that can be opinionated, you know, that can be um, not afraid of confrontation. And some of the things people say to me and do to me in the community, whether it's indirect or not, they will call them out on it, you know. And, you know, so I don't do any of those things. And that's kind of like a definite, like a, me describing my personality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mainly ignore stuff, you know, but that don't make it okay for you to continue to do it just because... I'm not pulling earpieces out of people's ears or confront people out in the community. They don't give people in the community okay, uh, okay to read my mind for 16 years. You know, and I spend my time on this medicine, believe it or not, you know, a lot of this is them assassinating my character. But I spend the major majority of my time trying to make people in this community like me. You know, regardless of some of the offensive stuff I say, that's from uh, um, 
a reaction. That's the, some of the offensive stuff I say is me reacting to my situation, my environment, my treatment. It's not something that's in me that I go around saying to people. Mm-hmm. You know, so we're good. And that creates confirmation, not confirmation bias. It's a lot of that too. But that creates the offensive stuff I say creates resentment to make people resent me. And in return, soon these people come up and say something about me, they, they people want to hate me and want to resent me. So that's where the confirmation bias come into play. You know, I done seen situations where I was 100% right for what I said or thought. And people shot me down as if I just made it up because they chose to pick a side other than mine. Mm. You know, and, you know, that's that's a thing, you know. And, like, Stephen Colbert, I saw last week when I was looking at the Grammys, they had a commercial, and he said, you know, on, on like, a, um, com- I don't know what you call it, a commercial, you know, I guess, um, through, when the Grammys was going on, and he said something about, uh, and this is me paraphrasing it. He says something about they're basically they're talking about you would make you look bad to distract from talking about what the real issues are. And that's not fair to me. You know, these people are damaging my reputation, they're da- damaging, you know, my relationships, you know, and it, it's not fair to me. Every everywhere I go while I'm on this medicine, people gonna know who I am. And either gonna laugh at me or hate me for it, you know. And you know, but I didn't give them the right to violate my human rights, you know. And now, you know, I'm like, I'm gonna talk about that more. I'm still not gonna, you know, act on it as far as people in the community. But I'm gonna express my concern for my human rights a little more. Because back to what I said, like, um, who is presenting evidence that there was a crime to where they gave me this medicine, to where they could violate my human rights? I, I want to know where's who, who's who's doing it. Because for one, there isn't any, and two, you know, it's a government crime. Like, government is the one doing all the stuff and committing all the crimes, you know, and nobody's talking about it. Just like what I was saying with Stephen Colbert, you know, and, you know, like, and then this is another thing, like, I talk about Young Jeezy a lot. Like, Jeezy said on a mixtape, um, can't ban the snow movie. That was the name of the mixtape, and I wrote this down. He said, to fail or succeed, I don't know what's worse. They just try to find a glitch in my matrix one slip, and I'm back to the basics. How would you interpret that if he was talking about someone or myself, which more than likely he were? The question I, is, what do you think the basics were? I have, I have no I, idea. I'm going to tell you, but... Um, I, I have no idea. So. The base, once to fail or succeed, I don't know what's worse. One slip, then I'm back to the basics. The basics is people wanting to kill me. That's what he mean by that. That's what you you're know, saying. Yeah, yeah. People want to kill me. And to fail or succeed, I don't know what's worse, means it's two sides. Meaning that it's one that want me to fail and stay out and not talk about things, and the other want me to succeed. And both sides are dangerous, which can put me in danger. That's what he mean by that. To fail or succeed, I don't know which words. One slip, trying to find a glitch in my matrix mean that if they uncover that I done something and threaten their freedom, or if I was like some type of informant, which they claim they speculated because of what I was putting in music, they thought I said something I had no business saying. And if that turned out to be true and I was an informant, then that's the glitch in my matrix to where it's going to be back to the basics. Because like Jesus said a year before I was put on this medicine, he came out with an album 
and the whole album was about me. It was called Thug Motivation 101. And he said, that's not going to get you on. That's going to get you hurt. And then he also said, no punchlines, no riddles. I'm talking white squares with the steps in, in the middle. And then, which is referring to um, something else he said. Uh, um, God, I can't think of it right now. But he talks a lot about people. He said, and like when he said, no punchlines, no riddles. I'm talking white squares with the stamps in the middle. He says something about, you know me, I take the good with the bad. You know, that's saying that something is going to happen. That's possibly can be good, but then also it's going to be bad, which refers to, like, I think the good was they was going to give me a record contract. And because T.I. talks about that, too, where he lied and said there's, you know, a rap, up and coming rapper with AIDS and a newborn baby that he's going to give a record deal to. You know, they tell they tell him a lot of lies about me. So the good is the record contract. The bad is being in this situation and going through what I had to go through. And then they try to act like this wasn't supposed to be this way and that things didn't go according to plan. But when you read somebody's mind and give the whole community air pieces, how do you expect that to go right? Like, I would love to see, and that's what a lot of people in the community think, oh, I got caught up in the drug deal and went bad. Well, how would it win if the drug deal went good? You know, that's a question no one's thinking of, asking or questioning of what that answer would have been. What, I would have been on the medicine for two weeks and they would have taken it off of me. How would it, how would this situation have went right? You know, and I don't believe that drug dealing story anyway. I think they made that up so they can justify the long duration of me being on this medicine. And like, for example, like my aunt, and my, remind you, my aunt, she just straight, like she don't do any drugs. She don't drink alcohol. She don't smoke cigarettes. Well, she was mad. And this was in the very beginning when I was first put on this medicine. She was mad about how this affected our family and myself. And she come in the house and say something about a pillar of the community whose name is Donahue. And he used his... Um, holding company, which is him and a, a bunch of other people, as the mate, as the brand name, which is his last name. And she come in the house and say uh, something about him being a drug dealer. And I never knew this. And I'm like, I knew who he was. I knew he probably had 15 to 20 properties in my town. But I, I, I didn't know he was a drug dealer. And he's actually a lawyer you know, with a holding company in his name. And she come to the house man and said, you know, he, he's he's the drug dealer. And, you know, when I was put on this medicine, I was 21. You know, so I'm still young. What goes on in my community amongst adults, in which he's an adult probably around her mm -hmm. age, they're not going to sit in the room and talk to me about that. You know, and my aunt never talked like that before. So for her to say that. That seemed like a really big deal to you. Yeah, and she was, she was really upset, you know, because it's one of those things where my family did nothing. Like, and like her husband made a sacrifice. He had a state job at VDOT where he ran the district, I think. Something like that. He would probably make six or some thousand a year, you know. And then my brother gave up the military when he had just started a family, you know, to sacrifice because he tried to take leave when I was first put on this medicine. And I think they went out of their way to not grant him leave. And he wasn't going to war. He was just going off for six months. And, you mm -hmm. know, he wasn't mm -hmm. doing anything 
to where they should have said, okay, you can't take leave. But they denied him leave. And mind you, his brother was just put on the medicine, being held hostage. He could have left for six months. And no one knew the future. I could have died while he out at sea. You know, so that's more likely the reason why he wanted to take leave to be with me. You know, to see how things were going to play out with me. They denied him that. So you know what he did? He went AWOL. My ex girl. He just quit. Yeah, he went, he went AWOL. Yeah. You know, and my ex girlfriend, she was in college. You know, so it's so many people that made sacrifices to try to help me. And none of, none of it should have ever happened. My brother should have stayed in the military. You know, the ex should have stayed in college. You know, everybody, because that's what I would have wanted for them. I, I, I don't like that. And that's just to name a few. There's some people that, you know, make sacrifices for me that I probably don't even realize they have. You know, but this situation is it, so wrong and so many people put their life on hold for me and then for them to be treated the way they're being treated, for me to be treated the way I'm being treated, all their sacrifices has been in vain. You know, and it's, it's not right. It's, it's really not right, you know. And when I bring it up that, oh, they made these sacrifices, they like, oh, no, we didn't. We didn't do these things for you. Oh, no, that's okay. what I, but is, that's, is that what they're saying? That's what they're saying, but that's what I think, you know. Mm -hmm. And and that's the that seems to be the story with everything, no matter who I talk to. Everybody I talk to about this stuff, they're like, well, you're not getting your mind right, you know. You're being paranoid, like, my diagnosis is paranoid schizophrenia. Right, yeah. I, that, that doesn't surprise me. You know, you know so. That's, <laughs> well, that is how you can make lots of meanings on that. But that's how people who don't perceive these things that you're perceiving <laughs> would make sense of it. Because yeah. they're, you know, I have, but, I have. But I'm not. Clients that, you know, have uh, schizophrenia and but, they see things that or hear things or understand things that other people don't. And that's kind of the diagnosis that gets put on it. And that's what Risperdal is for. Is, is for. So, yeah. so and, I, I was guessing that's probably so, the diagnosis that people so, have given you. You know, the reality is, you know, I, I'm like, let's lay all the cards on the table now because, you know, my back been hurting me by my kidneys for the last two three days um i'm sorry to I got, hear that that's I got, fun my, i got kidney issues i got liver issues thyroid issues lost some of my vision behind this medicine I got platelet issues i got probably over a dozen different health issues that's going to lead to a stroke or a heart attack you know stress they say it's the solid killer so at this point I'm like, let's lay all the cards on the table, you know, and let's, you know, I, I have nothing to hide. You know, my family has nothing to hide, you know, and my family is being extorted. They try to extort me and I'm not going to allow them to do that to me because I'm in a position where I got nothing to lose, you know, because the reality is I don't think they're ever going to take me off this medicine. You know, and they got the means to do it. They can take me off at any time they want. You know, and I'm a little tired of how George Bush uses terrorists that he's allied with to push his agendas. Because you think about the 9-11, what, 14 out of the 17 or 19, something like that. I know it was 80% so of them was from Saudi Arabia. And then we have situations where, like, Donald Trump, campaign campaigning to be president talking about how the Saudis did 9-11 but we invaded Iraq and Afghanistan so, so you know Osama is a Saudi you know and I think we it's at a point where everybody know what Bush is it what Bush is and that there are people in our government who are allied with Al Qaeda just like how they say Obama funded them 
to fight Syrian backed rappers, uh, Iranian backed rappers in Syria. You know, and you know, and I've actually had people say that to me. I've, I've had people like my Barbara, when I was at Central State in 2000, what, 15, 16? She she was she was one of the ones talking saying the same thing I'm stuff I'm just saying. She even went as far as said that she heard stories how um they had Osama bin Laden surrounded over there in the Middle East. US soldiers had him surrounded and was told to stand down. I don't know where she got that from, what kind of conspiracy that is, but that's things that are floating and circulating. Mm. Like, you know, so people, you know, this is not terrorist medicine. I know that for a fact. Because for one, they would have picked a high value target. Not someone that deal with the same type of issues they deal with. They deal with the things that we deal with at home. They deal with them abroad. You know, so they're not hurting the American government by putting a young black kid on my reading medicine. And then, you know, the American government slandered the, slandered the kid that's on the medicine, which is me, to where I'm the bad guy. So it serves them no purpose to continue this out because at the end of the day, no one cares about what happened to me or, going, or what's going to happen to me. It's only sad to people that experience it firsthand. And when they are out of the radius of where it affects them, then they don't care because they probably resent me and hate me anyway from the offensive things I say. So, well, or are they just worried about all the stuff that's going on in their own lives? That tr that too, you know. So, you know, but I guess I ended on this, like, you know, you know, like I was just saying about the gentleman from my town, the pillar of my mm -hmm, community, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Donahue. I I don't know this dude. He don't know me. Never met him. Mm -hmm. You know, but. That must be the fight, you know, celebrities against my community and people in Virginia. But I don't, I don't think that's a real fight. I think they're actually allied with each other, and it's really just a divide and conquer scheme. And, you know, and I'm, I'm saying this to you, but, you know, as far as naming him, but I, I've never disclosed his name to anyone else, you know, because... I, I know who's who. I know that this is a divide and conquer scheme, you know, and I, I'm protecting myself because I feel like my community, they not they don't do right by me. You know, they don't do right by me. And it, to give you a prime example, like when this first happened, my ex-girlfriend and her current boyfriend come to work with me and not just come to work at my job, they put her boyfriend in the same department as me and on the same schedule as me. This was back in 2006? 2006. What good was going to ever come from that? And they did all that to call themselves helping me. You know, I don't understand, for one, their logic and thinking, just like how I was talking about with the dude who um, got fired for looking at child porn when that's based off of a reference point that I don't get the reference point. It's based off of me when I was like nine or 10 years old looking at a picture on Rotten.com of Mike Tyson when he was naked. And I looked at the picture. And then when I was put in the medicine, I was embarrassed that I actually looked at the picture. And that's what that reference point derived from where they used a guy at my old job and fired him for child porn. You know how he going to have to explain that and what he probably, who knows if he have all the details and how some of these things going to make me look, you know, and just like, like what I was saying with my ex-girlfriend and her boyfriend. Now, I cared about her a lot. You know, I'm over her now. But at that time, I would say three, three weeks before I was put on this medicine, we was talking about getting back together and she was with this guy. And we was talking about getting back together. I went on a date from a girl that lived in, I went on a date with a girl that lived in Richmond that I met through my family member who went to college with her friend. We went on a date 
and um, nothing happened, just one date. And I called my ex, you know, a couple days later to talk to her, you know. And she was upset with me, and she fussed at me. You know, like, you still playing, like, you still playing, playing games. I don't know who told her I went on a date. That's goes stuff back. Stuff like stuff like that can, gets around. You know, that's that's kind of what I'm saying. Like a lot of things happen that I don't know how they happen. And that was around that was about three weeks before I was put in this situation with on this medicine. You know, so I cared about her. I did want to work things out with her. And she didn't have to fear me or anything of that nature. But when, I'm, when I was put on this medicine and I go to work and she show up there with her boyfriend and you don't, and you think that that's a good idea, knowing that everybody at work had earpieces at that time, including her and her boyfriend, and they all show up at my job and you did that to help me, you could at least put her boyfriend in another, she wasn't in my department, you could at least put them in the same department or put him in a different apartment from me and you put her boyfriend in my department which was a bellman uh, slash valet attendant and then schedule him to come work the same uh, 3 to 11 shift with me and you don't think you're I'm, putting I'm, me in I'm imagining that was a tough thing to you, yeah, tough shift to work you put me I know, it gives me two minutes. Oh, no, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we got a few minutes. And you put me in such a compromising position, you know, and had me looking like a fool, you know, and I handled it professionally. I did. I didn't argue with him or her. I handled it professionally. But, you know, it made me look stupid. And, um... You look, and did I listen to Jay-Z where he was, he talks about that he said, looked at Hove like he does something wrong to him because he owned to him. He just took what belonged to him. Meaning like I got my ex back, you know, mm. like, you know, but I didn't get it back, you know. But that's what he was referring to. He was referring to that incident. You know, and he also said in that song, the same song is called Dig a Hole. He also said in that song, Jay Z says, um, even, even when you win, ultimately you lose. So this is a situation where people is gonna this is gonna is not gonna do it. people are gonna break the law and the evidence that vindicate me is not gonna come forward. The witnesses that they're gonna try to they're gonna try to say, oh Terrell has a bad memory, he's delusional, he's incompetent. But there are witnesses that can account for pretty much everything I've been to you. Everything, you know, so have they talked to them to corroborate my story? Are they going to? No, because the reality is they want to sweep this under the rug. Like, for example, when I was looking at TV, BT, where they only aired something that was on my TV, which is owned by Viacom, just like Spike Channel, they said something about Bush Foods America, World War Me, and 100% proof, you know. I'm not the only one that's a witness to that. I, I have someone that can account for that that actually happened. A, a couple people where, you know, and one probably don't even know he is a witness to that. He can, you know, because I saw that these things was on my TV and I was like, you know what, this don't look like it's normal to be on TV. So I call a family member who like to watch the same stuff I look at mm -hmm. on TV. And the show that was supposed to be aired at that given time was being aired on his TV, which was 106 in Park. I heard it in the background, but something was entirely different being aired on my TV. Right. And, and what's tough is without having, like, without being able to record that, you it's hard to prove. prove. It's hard and to prove pretty... because, because with people who have delusions, like, they see things yeah, but it's that also other people witnesses. so so like to to have that proof like that's you, when you you're so proof. stuck. Yeah, you need proof, and it's witnesses that can prove that these things happen. But did you want to? Yeah. yeah, it's witnesses that can prove these things happen, but they're not going to come forward out of fear.